Hello, everybody. Welcome to the first episode of um, the Goofy History Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host today. Say hello, co-host. What's up? Hello. Hello. Okay. So today we got some good topics for our our inaugural episode. We are going to be talking about the the not necessarily infamous Jack Churchill, the Dancing Plague, and the Emu War. Three favorites. Three no well known events, but maybe you don't know super deep into them. So we're gonna get started. I am going to go first. I am going to be talking about Jack Churchill. So Jack Churchill was a British man, but he was not born in he was not born in Britain. He was born in the British Empire in British Ceylon, which is modern day Sri Lanka. His father was a civil engineer, so basically he worked with bridges, structures, stuff like that. But then, at a young age, it doesn't specify how old he was, his family used to British Hong Kong, because it was under British control, and his father got a job as director of public works. So, old Jack Churchill, old Mad Jack, came from a family of money. Now, um, this is where it starts to get a little weird, but, eh. (laughs) He starts to, something changes over time, and he becomes a little bit of a silly goose. Um, he graduates from the Royal Military College, a now defunct military university. It was kind of like West Point, but British. I'm assuming you two are both familiar with West Point. Yes. Not really. Okay. Well, West Point is a military academy. Um, I think it's... Where is it? Let me Google that. It is some... West Point is in... Um... It's in... It's in New York. But, um, it's a military academy. So then he, um, after, during the interwar period, which is the period between World War One and World War Two, which, out of curiosity, do you guys think World War One or World War Two is more interesting? World War Two. Oh, uh, yeah, World War Two for sure. I disagree, actually. I think World War One is more interesting, because we had the first tanks, first planes, or at least first planes used in battle, and there was a lot of innovation that needed... The Allies wouldn't have won if it wasn't for some really smart people out there, and I think it's just fascinating. America! <laughs> oh, Jesus. Okay. After completing a signals course in Burma, where he served for ten years, he rode a Zenith motorcycle, which I do not know. I think that brand might be... Does it, do either of you guys know what a Zenith motorcycle is? Do you guys know if it's, know if it's defunct or not? I don't know. I oh. will take a look. Um, it's... Well, people are still selling it. It looks like it went defunct in 1950. Somebody's selling one on Facebook Marketplace. Oh, let's go. Okay. So, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So, um, on his drive through the entire con- subcontinent of India, he, um, it was, it's 1,500 kilometers, which is about... Yeah, in London, 1903 was when the motorcycle was made. Okay. Um... Well, it's 932 miles for the American listeners. Um, and he at one point crashed into a buffalo, or at least supposedly crashed into a buffalo. The val- the validi- validity, the validity of that claim That's is. Deep questionable, but you know what? It's a funny part of the story, so let's just go with it. He also learned the bagpipes while he was in Burma, and got damn good at them. Um, he was also an incredible archer, which is, um, so this kind of goes into, when he returned to England, he returned in, uh, 1936, but he remained on the officer's reserve list. So in a case of a war, <laughs> World War Two, <laughs> he would get called back in. So he represented the UK in the World Archery Championship in 1939. As I said, he was a great archer. But then, uh uh-oh, Hitler got a silly idea, and World War II started. So he was pulled into World War II, where he served in many locations. Namely, France, and uh, I believe the Balkans and Yugoslavia. But we'll get to that later. He used his bow and arrow while he was on patrol, because it is accurate up to 200 yards and silent, which makes sense. Well, how do you guys feel if you just were... Imagine, imagine you're a Nazi and you were running around and um, you get an arrow through... Just just an arrow through any part of your body. 
First, I would think an arrow. Who's well, using a bow and arrow? I'd probably collapse to the ground, and number two, I'd probably start screaming in pain. Yeah, that's fair. But I would also think it's. I think it would be a little bit silly too. Just imagine yeah, like, you're you're walking around that's completely silent, and then you hear, and you just absolutely get annihilated with by some random British dude with a bow and arrow. But who's you know? I'd think who's using a bow and arrow. What silly goose is using a bow and arrow right now? We literally have guns. I, I mean, to each their own. I think it would be hilarious if I got shot by a bow and arrow. I think that'd be funny, too. So he shot an approaching Nazi with his bow and arrow at the Battle of La Epinette. I think that's how you pronounce that. I do not want to butcher that. La Epinette? That sounds right. He also loved to blare incredibly loud British folk tunes on his bagpipes and then throw large amounts of grenades at enemies. Just getting <laughs> absolutely silly out there on the battlefield. Imagine you hear some guy shredding on the bagpipes and, like, ten forbidden pineapples just show up and just blow your entire unit to pieces. So he earned the military cross, which is kind of like... It's like... That's kind of that's kind of funny, actually. What, him earning the military I'd... cross or the forbidden pineapples? Well, yeah, that... I would be embarrassed if I died. I, I well, would I be die embarrassed. Like, if I'd die laughing. I don't know if I would die laughing. I'd probably go, oh, dear God. And then I'm going to get one of those shreds. I would be highly embarrassed in my everything. Especially if you are if you survived. I would never be able to live with the shame. But basically, the military cross is a, um, citing Wikipedia, the military cross, MC, is the third level, second level, 1933, 1993, sorry, military decoration awarded to officers since 1993, and, oh, and since 1993, other ranks of the British Armed Forces and formally awarded to officers of other Commonwealth countries. Um, the MC is granted in recognition of, quote, an act or acts of exemplary gallantry during active operations against the enemy on land. So I don't know what the U.S. equivalent to that would be, but I have no clue. Okay, this is where it gets especially goofy. Um... Using his um, clay bag, which is a Scottish, like a Scottish longsword. So he goes up, he's in, he's in the middle of World War II in France, and he's got a sword and a bow. He is responsible for the capture of 42 Nazis. Really? That? 42. And then he got sent to Sachsenhausen camp, um, concentration camp, after being knocked out by a grenade while supposedly playing Will he no come back again on the pipes? So, that's unfortunate. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, this is where his ingenuity, which has already been put on full display, comes in. And he gets to thinking. He's thinking, well, what if? What if I were to... What if I were to get out? So he tunneled out of the camp and does recaptured and got sent to a POW camp in Austria instead. Promptly escaped from that camp and walked across the Brenner Pass, which is a valley in the Alps. And then, um, he's just getting crazy. He got sent to Burma at the end of the war, which is, uh, what is now Myanmar. Do you guys know where that is? Myanmar? <laughs> no, I have no clue. It's, the country? It's by Thailand. Yeah. The so, he gets sent to Burma at the end of the war. And, of course, I believe he got sent to Burma in... 1945. Well, I know he, it's 1945, but I'm not sure when in 1945. But one of his most famous quotes was uttered right after the end of war. If it weren't for those damn Yanks, we could have kept the war going another ten years. And then you'd assume, well, he probably just went back to his normal life of World War II, just with his family. False. He continued serving in the military, and ev and eventually... He got out, but he also, which I'm not sure if this part was in his, during his military service or not, but he saved hundreds of li saved the lives of hundreds of staff and patients at the Hadassah Hospital near Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Oh, God, I cannot talk today. Which is pretty amazing. He also led expeditions in Norway during 1941. So he was in France during 1940. Norway during 1941 and 1942, Italy during 1943, Yugoslavia in 1944, where he was captured, and it was Burma in 1945. But, so, in, 19, in Yugoslavia, the following morning after he decided to withdraw and relaunch the attack the next morning, a flanking attack was sent out. Only Churchill and six other men 
were able to reach the objective. And then a mortar shell killed or wounded everyone but Churchill, who was playing Will Ye No Come Back Again on his pipes as the German advanced. He was knocked unconscious by grenades and then captured. And then believing he was related to Winston Churchill, who was the Prime Minister of Britain at the time, obviously, they thought that they, uh, he, they thought he was related to Winston Churchill. German military intelligence had sent Churchill flown into Berlin for investigation. Jack Churchill, not Winston. After he was sent to a special compound for, quote, prominent POWs, which had some actual or suspected relatives of Winston Churchill, which within the grounds of the concentration camp I mentioned previously. Uh, yeah, pretty, pretty, pretty... Okay, here, post-war. So, um, um, one of my co-hosts, you are, are you familiar with post-war uh, Israeli history? No, not... Uh, me, not really. Yeah, not, yeah. Uh, are you, do you know of the Hadashah Convoy Massacre? No. Nope. Basically, Arab forces, um... By... I'm, I'm, I know more about stuff like the Yom Kippur War and stuff like that. All right. Basically, um, during when during the times of British colonization, it was a civil war in mandatory Palestine, which was the area that um, the Brits controlled in what is now Israel. Um, so they were ambushed by Arab forces when a, con a convoy that was um, moving medical and military supplies and personnel up to Hadassah Hospital, like I mentioned previously, it was ambushed by Arab forces. 78 Jewish doctors, nurses, students, patients, faculty members, and Haganah fighters, and one British soldier were killed in the attack. But what old Jack Churchill did, he got hundreds of people out of there and brought them to safety, which is a heroic act. He is quite a G for that. And then um, his son said that he was quite a peace-loving man at home. But he would do this thing, so the train would go back, go, go past his house, when he would take the train home from work, he would do this thing where he would open the window of the train and throw his luggage, or not his luggage, his suitcase, out of the window. Everyone thought he was crazy, he was just throwing it into his own back garden. What the? Um, that's, that's smart. But, he's a, he's a silly guy, but, sadly... Um, John and Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, DSO and Bar, MC and Bar, died at the age of 89 in Chertsey, UK. Um, I'm sure that was a life well lived. You guys got any comments on that? No. Yeah. Um, no, not really. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, call host number two. It's, it's your turn. Wait, what's, what do you got? Uh, I got the Dancing Plague. Um, a very... Fun, not so much funny, but you know, in the prospect of what actually happened is pretty funny. At the start of 1518, people started dancing uncontrollably. Were uh, from jig? what? Were they just hitting a jig? Yes, they just started just doing something. And, um, in it, the most documented is from Schwanzburg. France, uh, they danced uncontrollably. The first person that was uh, recorded was Fran. She stepped into the street. I'm pretty sure I said that name wrong. She stepped into the street. Uh, I believe that is Frau. Oh, okay. She stepped into the street and she could not... She just walked up and she could not stop dancing. What is the, and, what is the catalyst for this event? Uh, what, what was What was she thinking? She walked outside, you know what, I feel, I really feel like, I feel like boogie. I feel like yeah, I think she, she was walking into the street, everybody was looking down, and she was like, maybe I just need to hit a quick little boogie, a little jig. Yeah, it's so sad in 1500 France, I gotta, I gotta get a little deviant. Yeah, she was definitely feeling like, all these people are down, they gotta work so much and everything, let's just hit a quick little dance, yeah. lighten people's moods. Hit a boogie. Well, eventually, she collapsed from ex uh, ex uh, ex exhaustion. Ex yeah, I can't s speak at all. Um, but then after, you know, a few hours, she rested and everything. She just got back up and straight back to d doing a little boogie. Bro had to hop dance. Sneeze, bro had to <laughs> yeah, and then she, she, could con she continued for, excuse me, for days. And then within a few weeks... Well, recorded 30 other people also just started hitting a dance. Bro's got the dancing and disease. They even danced past 
injury. So they had, like, broken legs, broken ankles from just sitting there hitting the little dance all the time. But they just continued. Are people, they... like, beating their legs in with clubs to stop them from dancing? This next part will tell you. After the city authorities were alarmed, with the increasing number of dancers, people stuck with this plague, they just put all their dancers in guild halls. And they arranged, they even, I don't know why, but they had musicians and pro dancers. Well, it's a, would probably be like a large building. Yeah, a large building. You know, like a city hall, how they're like large and it has like one okay. big like hallway type thing. Yeah, 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 I see. They got musicians and pro dancers. So the musicians to play the music for some reason, even though they didn't need music to help dance, they just started dancing you gotta get, and then they had be dancing you might as well dance to some tunes some 1500 yeah tunes. probably with some good music yeah. and then they had uh pro dancers to teach and help the infected the people who were sitting there hitting the quick jig to you know make sure they didn't hurt themselves as much when they were dancing to be more light on their feet uh eventually 400 people were infected Number of them did die from the injuries that they just continued to just didn't care about and just continued to My hit the boogie. Is, how much do you have to dance to break your limbs? Well, you got to think they were probably hitting some 15, 18, like little boogie. They were, they were hitting wasn't. some mad moves. They were probably hitting some moves that probably damn really hurt the legs. <laughs> they were hitting or that, maybe they just. They were hitting that pre colonial. Yeah, they probably were sitting there not even, like, they might have had, like, some not even good dancing shoes or anything. They might have been, like... I think they shoes had their... in general were bad in the 1500s. <laughs> that is true. They were probably were, like, sandal-looking stuff. But, um, after they all helped them, people, a bunch of people were getting affected. And then it, at the start of September, about a few months later... Um, they just start, uh, it started to dial down, people started to not dance as much, not boogie down as much. You know, the, lots of the time they say, like, sneezing is contagious, yawning is contagious, but in 1518, dancing was contagious. Uh, like I said at the start, this was the most documented. It wasn't the only thing like that happened. It happened, uh many times and then it started spreading down the Rhine river to many towns so people wait, thought it, it was demonic like possession a, was it spreading like a real disease or was it like uh it was spreading like a it was spreading like people were boogieing uh-oh is it my turn it, uh they thought it was demonic possession and overheated blood but no, not um overheated blood because you know at the time they didn't think possession. it was gonna that that demon is going crazy, getting all these people to dance. Obviously, they didn't think, like, there was demonic possession and stuff. Like, well, I mean, they thought that's... Because, you know, obviously, they were very more Christian and more about church than we are in this day and age. Yeah. So, any really bad thing, they kind of marked it up to the cause of de demonic possession or the person... Oh, no, I have cancer in one of my testicles. Damn it was you, because of Satan! Satan. Yeah, and basically any disease they got is, oh, we haven't been, you know, being too good. We're all been sinning. People in our town have been sinning. We need to, you know, get rid of them or something. The gods aren't happy with us. Uh-oh. You know, whatever they believed in. Uh, what is, and then... Okay. How did they go about fixing this? They, uh, they couldn't really just fix it. They just kind of, because they obviously didn't have very good medicine, because it was very old. They probably just sat there eating either like a bunch of herbs, or they wait. They waited for the disease to kind of just pass. Obviously, probably like kept healthy people and elderly away from the people that were infected with the plague. Obviously, they're trying to preserve most people just in case if this plague did. Mo which it did kill them in the end. They wanted to, you know, ha have people who, d so they could still continue with the whole town and village. W. It obviously, because if some farmers 
and stuff were infected, so some cities and towns did have series of uh, famines. Uh, and then while everybody else was staying away from the dancing plague, there were still other diseases that were also attacking them, like smallpox. Mm-hmm. I see. So, um, from what I'm looking at, just skimming Wikipedia, uh, what was Frau's last name? Trophia? Trophia? Yeah, um, okay. I didn't really, because I did not want to absolutely purge absolutely the butcher name. that name, yeah. Butcher, yeah. So I was just trying to refrain. So, um, from what I've seen, out of the six Chronicle accounts, four support Lady Trophia as the first dancer. So, W. Yeah. Um, and then modern theories, some believe that it was stress-induced mass hysteria. I mean, I guess that would have been pretty stressful, to be honest. And it, in the 20th century, investigators suggested that it was from bread that they consumed. Oh, black yeah, flour ergot. contaminated. Ergot, ergot ergo. Yeah. With some, uh, yeah, with a fungal disease inside the bread. And they just, obviously, they had, like, probably, they probably had other plants and vegetables, but bread was the main thing because it was easy to farm wheat. I hate eating, so, I hate accidentally eating psychedelic bread. Well, because, you know, wheat is just out there in the open, probably a bunch of bugs transferring diseases while doing whatever they're doing to the wheat, eating it. And then all those people just started chomping down on that bread. And next thing they know, they were dancing. They were eating money? They were so happy. Like, oh my god, this bread tastes so good. That they just had to hit a quick boogie. Yo, this bread goes ham! John Waller, a American medical historian, thought it was some sort of psychogenic disorder. What does psychogenic mean? It is, uh, well, if we break the words down. I just Google it. Having a psychological or general cause rather than a physical. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. So they just, they were just like, okay. Uh, it's, well, obviously, because now we have more advanced, more advanced, like, uh, medical searches and technology. So they were like, it's probably just something that, you know, the infected bread got into their psyche and so made them the dance or something. Right? Now, from based off of that, I just know now I got to check my bread before I eat it. Make sure there's no funny little pl- plagues or diseases inside That's my bread. That's definitely the lesson that we should t- take away from this. <laughs> yes. I don't you think better check your about bread. human nature or anything. I think it's, we gotta check no. this bread. Yeah, you, make sure you run them tests on that bread. You gotta, you gotta break out the, you gotta break out the, uh, toddler science, or, let me, you gotta break yeah. out the baby university, the year, the baby university board book set. A science for toddlers board and book set. Let's go. Yeah. So, I think we can take away from this is, that bread crazy, for real. That bread is crazy, and uh, and then bust let's, out that science kit before you eat bread. Let's get this bread, gamers. Okay. Well, uh, I believe it is time for the last co-host. Mm-hmm. Hi. <laughs> what is so. this doing? It's post World War One, right? Yep. And the Australian government is trying to give back to veterans and troops of World War One. So essentially, what they're doing is that they're providing land to troops that are coming home from the war, and they're also giving them incentives and subsidies, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, to farm. And well, they they encounter an issue, right, while farming. Uh, because what most of them, most most of them, uh, most of them are settling in. Uh, let me let me see, let me see. What is it called? The Western Australian Wheat Belt. That is a and funny they're, name. Uh, and they're yep. they're they're encountering an issue with the local animal population, specifically emus. No, because oh, not emus. Uh huh. Uh, and because um, they're essentially destroying their crops and destroying their fences and their farm property. Silly little guys. Yeah, and so but, big guys rather. It was nice of them to, you know, give them something after the war. Yeah. W. Something to go back to. Yeah. The gist. Yeah, they definitely, you know what they gave them to go back to? Emus. 
what um uh, at first the, the the farmers tried um taking care of the pest issue with their own firearms by protecting their property. However, um Themus uh like essentially adapted to to their to their tactics and their st- strategies because they were like way they were too fast and too agile for the farmers to uh, f- effectively eliminate. So the farmers ended up crawling to the Australian government for help. And in response to the farmers' um, requests for aids, they sent a group of soldiers led by Major, Major GPW Meredith, uh, as well as a few firearms like Maxim machine guns and I believe 10,000 rounds. And um, they were, their, their, their task was essentially to control the population of emus. So what they did was they set up base near a railroad to observe the emus. Mm-hmm. And after that, they essentially set into their plan, and they started just mowing emus down. And they were actually doing really effective against the emu population. For reference, but, um, emus are incredibly large. They can outrun a horse. They live for five to ten years, so pretty normal bird of mine. Uh, they're s- incredibly stupid. They're apparently one of the dumbest birds. What are, like what is their speed compared to like? A cheetah. They run at 30 miles an hour, whereas cheetahs run at 20 miles an hour. Not, Jesus not 20, Christ. Not 20. Oh my god, I'm having a stroke. Oh. 80 <laughs> miles an hour. Cheetahs run like a car on the highway. These run like a mom in a minivan on a public road. But still, pretty fast. Also, yeah. they can take bullets from HistoryExtra.com, which I'm not sure if that's a valid source or not. Quote, even when the soldiers did find their mark, the emus could withstand several bullets to their bodies, seemingly without knowing, let alone dying. Well, they're pretty big birds, right? They're large birds. How tall is it? So they probably could take a few bullets, depending on what they're... Emus average 175 centimeters or 5.7 feet tall, and they weigh 110 to 121 pounds. Damn. Three Aussie hunters found out from wearethemighty.com. I have no idea what that website is. Emus can take roughly five bullets before realizing they've been shot, and about ten before they die. They can also, um, they can also kill, they can kill coyotes with their feet, and they can tear down metal fences. That Uh, is... Probably the farming issue. Well, did they really have metal fencing during this time? Well, I don't know, maybe they had wire fencing. I think they Which probably had wire or something. But still. Anyways, they they were really effective at first, but um, uh, the same issue with the farmers is that the emus adapted to the, the, the troops' tactics of eliminating them in larger quantities. So um, that didn't really work. Like a horde of like 100 emo- emus just started yeah. rushing one farmer. And, and their, um, their gear, am I, uh, am I allowed to swear? Uh, I mean, I said damn, so... Uh, well, part of my French, but their equipment was quite shit, and they were coming into issues with their ammunition and their firearms, and the a population continued to go back to, um, being semi-normal, and they couldn't really control it after that. Yeah, the emus would still continue damaging pro- a farmer's crops and their property, etc., but, um, uh, yeah, and farmers started to get agitated with the Australian government's inability to fix the issue of it's like the U.S. The government. Kids. Yeah. But instead of social issues, it's they can't kill these big dumb birds that are pooping on my crops. And then um, the media started to report on this. The Australian government essentially became a laughing stock and was a source of embarrassment and ridicule from the world. Well, that's understandable. To people. Be honest. Yeah. Yeah. The operation lasted from the second of November, nineteen thirty-two, all the way until mm. December tenth, nineteen thirty-two. And um, it ended in an emu victory. Oh, hell no. Bro did not lose to the birds. Yeah. Oh, but I think I just clipped my mic. Oopsies. <laughs> it's gonna get really, really... Bro did not lose to the birds. I but think... I think... Are you? Are we done here? Or not yeah. done, done. I think we should do a recap. So, what do we take away from uh, Jack Churchill? Uh, that... He was uh, a badass. Yeah, he was yes, a pretty wild is. dude. And he, he did help a lot of... I am not exactly sure what his rank was in the military, but I will find that out. You would probably think decently, like, higher up in the rank. He's a lieutenant colonel. He was an officer. Oh, he's a lieutenant colonel? Yeah. Alright. So, 
when you Google him, just off the bat, and they have the, you know how there's the about section? Mm-hmm. Like, if you Google a person? Yeah. He says, John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill, DSO and Barr, MC and Barr was a British army officer. Nicknamed Fighting Jack Churchill and Mad Jack, he fought in the Second World War with a longbow, a Scottish broadsword, and a bagpipe. He was not messing around. Yeah, he was just trying to help a lot, of, which he did. He was just trying to act crazy. And um, if you go to look like, at his dad, um, if you can... So, they believe that his dad, Alec Fleming Churchill, they believe that he was also born in Ceylon. Um, they do not specify where in Ceylon. But, um... What's his dad? Yeah. Anything like? Ch- Jack Churchill's dad. Uh, his dad... His dad seemed to be a pretty level-headed fella. Um, he was in the Ceylon Civil Service and Director of Public Works in Hong Kong and Ceylon. That's interesting. So, so he he was he had two marriages or more than one because it says a record of his first marriage has not been found, but his uh, first wife's name is believed to be Elizabeth, Eleanor Elizabeth, and then Unden. He was confirmed to the Church of Saint Leonard Streatham uh, in 1889. I'll send what his dad looked like. There we go. Your people at home won't be able to see this, but that is what his dad looked like. Mm. And apparently, from if you go on to um, Mad Jack's article, um, you can see that they met him while staying with his cousin in 1967 when he came, when I, he came across for the evening. Um, him and Uncle Toby admiring very well-made and working model ships. So he was just kind of a silly guy. He liked his, he liked being a little crazy. Um. Hmm? But so his pa- his parents were they known as much as he was? Uh, his dad, uh, the director of public works, was like a high level government position. So his mm. dad was well known then, but kind of forgotten to history. Whereas I believe Jack was the opposite. He was n- not well known like during his life, or at least during World War Two, he was not super well known. But after his military service, that's when he became well known. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, uh, I think that's it for the recap on this. I think we should head on to the Dancing Plague recap. So, the main takeaway that we appeared at the end, at least, of our conversation about the Dancing Plague was, make sure make sure you check your bread before you eat it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think there was, wasn't there an episode of, like, I don't know if you guys watched House MD, but there was an episode no. where there, uh, one person had an ergo. Erg- ergot? How do you pronounce that? I, oh. I'm tempted to pronounce it Urgit, but... Okay, we'll just have to go with that be- for now, because... Uh, I, don't know. I don't know if you guys ever... Samo Nella, I believe, Samo Nella Academy on YouTube, I believe he covered the Dancing Plague. I think he did, because I distinctly remember the um, part where he eats the bread and then the guy goes absolutely crazy. Uh, so for the people at home, you're going to hear what... you. I have my desktop audio on, so you can... Urgit. That's how you pronounce it. Urgit. Okay. So, what interests me about this is how it suddenly appeared, but then disappeared. And if it was Urgot, how would so many people get a, get a, become affected by it? And like you said, it was traveling um, through the, uh, the like, uh, well, the, at least what they found out was from the bread. Mm-hmm. So, it must have been some sort of bug or something, or animal that was going through crops. And just as they were either eating it or destroying the crops, left behind some other disease to spread to like inside in the ground. Which when the new crops grew, grew uh, the they would also obtain that disease that they were carrying. And then when they went to go harvest, turn it into good old bread, took a bite out of it. Um, a few di- probably a few days later, took them. Well, not even probably a few days, maybe like a few hours later. I think it would be longer than system. that. I imagine it was sitting. Oh, you mean like when the fungus got to their body? I imagine yeah. that bread was sitting in there for weeks and maybe months. And as bringing that into fact, there could have been. It could have also been like when the bread was just they had it in like storage or something. It could have gotten all the fungus-y. fungal infection. Yeah, because. It could it could also be that instead of just the crops getting the fungus. Yeah, the crops then, could have been fine, but then once they got in, I don't know how how does it spread. Let me Google that. Like uh, 
I don't know. It could have infection of the cereal flowers, and it's said so that fungus are spores. So it could have been in the warehouse or the um, actual plant. And yeah. Plus, in the 1500s, there would have been no way to test for that. Yeah, because they didn't obviously have like very like high medical and testing and scientific like scientific things that could really test for disease. They still thought you could make time. gold out of your pee. So. so. Uh, but I, if I was during that time, I would have no way, unless I was like ahead of my time. Yeah. I would have had no way to tell that. Like it said, in the 20th century, they finally figured out that it could have been, you know, something from the bread or something. It took them years to finally figure out, oh, it might be from the bread. Mm. Or that caused some sort of, uh, like, brain disease. And I'm sure, this is the early 1500s, I'm sure everyone was super focused on the new world and not some weird bread. Yeah, not some bread that, oh, there's a little bit of, like, some sort of, like, fungus or something that on tastes, the side of it. Let's that just, tastes kind of weird. <laughs> let's just cut it off. They probably just thought, oh, just cut the fungus off, the bread's still good. Yeah. So, what I'm, what I'm seeing is, I've gone on, you know how Wikipedia is, like, every, like, every year in science and whatnot? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is about math. Um, a lot of it is about medicine. Uh, the College of Physicians was founded in London on September 23rd, and then someone wrote the first monograph on the neurosurgery. That's kind of cool. And then, yeah, you know, the dancing plague. Uh, at, um, Strasbourg is right on the border of modern-day France and Germany. I don't know what France looked like. Like, what was... I don't know what the border was like in 1518. Which, like, nowadays, if you really think about, like, all the diseases that have been recently found, it those diseases, like, were really big years before, like, many, many years before. Yeah. It's finally them researching the disease and being like, oh... This is actually what the disease was from, and what it was, and what it caused. Yeah. Back back then, it, they just thought, oh, it's uh, probably some sickness going around. It's mm-hmm. totally not the bread. The bread is all good. Just yeah. a little bit of fungus that we have to probably cut off, but otherwise, the bread's all good. I don't think our funky I don't think our funky rye bread is the problem. I think it's Satan. Yeah, definitely. So you're just randomly dancing. Because of you've been sinning, you haven't been going to church. It's I've been of sinning, and I can't stop dancing now. I'm having too much fun. All right, I think that covers our wrap up on the dancing plague. So let's get to the emu war. All right. So basically, what I assume um I could take out of this is that um do not underestimate Mother Nature. I would say that's pretty good, cause I think yeah. it is. I think it's. It's interesting that massive birds could beat Australia in a battle. Yeah. Also, something yeah. to add on to that, I believe it um it shaped hunting laws too. Uh, in what and, uh, way? How to deal with, like, as in how to deal with wildlife, like wildlife population control, uh, et cetera, et cetera, stuff like that. Oh, all right, that makes sense actually. Yeah, but uh, you know, but nowadays there's more, rep- like, instead of more killing, it's more like repellent type stuff. More. Yeah. Probably tougher things to guard. Mm. I haven't heard recently, at least, that there's, like, some sort of animal or something eaten through crops. Yeah. But I would never think of some emus were able to survive, like, ten bullets each and able to beat, like, a... Like, how big do you think their little groups? Probably, like, ten people with, like, guns be able to lose to a bunch of birds big birds that would be shameful i'm surprised they even like recorded it they probably would have been like if they had the chance they would have probably just covered it up and like what nothing i think it's i think it's a funny thing to have happen yeah but but then you also got to think back then it was all about who had more like strength in like the countries yeah because lots of people were probably trying to uh you know this country is better than your country Mm-hmm. stuff like that so it was all about strength and somebody seeing you die to well not die but lose to a bunch of emus they would probably think down of you and be like yeah your your ar- uh, your army and your weapons aren't probably that good we should probably you know attack you yeah i would be thinking 
maybe uh, maybe this is not a thing to record. But I guess I think I, I'd be like maybe maybe we should just not record it. Not That's let kind anybody of out of, not let anybody out of this town know about it. Uh, just we could tell everybody if we did have a little problem that we uh, took them out very easily with all of our big weapons. Yeah. Just to keep, you know. I bet they were big. Keep face as not trying to lose any. Uh, Don't lose your show social credits. Yeah. I think that. Emus are a force to be reckoned with. Like, I do That's think if all insane. three of us boxed an emu, we would win. I think we would no. get we destroyed. Would, uh, even if it was a like a 3v versus 1 emo, emu, we probably had like a small chance, but we'd probably lose. Yeah. No because... one of our co-hosts, though, he'd probably have a six shooter and go... I don't if we're know. Fighting, if we're fighting fair, that emu is killing all of us. Yeah, as long, well, if we, like, had, like, an unfair advantage and brought a gun of some sort, then we'd probably win. But yeah, but maybe that emu boxing. has a gun, too. If the emu had a gun, yeah, I don't think, I don't think the crops would, they would be worrying about. I think they would be worrying about how the emus are running around with guns. Yeah, I'd be worried about that. I would not. I would not care about the crops. We can always replant. But if birds that run d decently fast, extremely fast for a bird, have guns, have opposable thumbs to shoot the gun, then I. I think I would just leave. I would just pack everything up and be like, goodbye. Yeah. I'm never coming back to this town again. <laughs> this area at all. I would. Uh, I would just be out of there. I'd be like, oh, so the, now they're running around with guns? Oh, goodbye. Yeah. Have fun. You can run around. You could go fight these things. Yeah, I would not want to be... I would not want to be an emu. But I do believe that wraps up our first episode. These mm -hmm. um these talks are shorter than usual because we're just kind of getting a feel for the format. Definitely going to need to research a little more thoroughly because we had to check Google lots of times. And definitely... Yeah. Definitely workshop it a little bit, but thanks for watching. Thanks for listening, actually, not watching. And uh, I hope you tune back in some other time. Uh, but yeah, thanks for watching, and hopefully you stay tuned for more. Also, um, episodes in the episodes in the future are going to be one topic per episode, not three. We just but didn't have enough, you know. We just we just didn't have enough information, so we just yeah kept going. But uh, yeah, thanks for listening, and will you return? See ya!